Hello everyone, I am Mohammed Hamama, and this is your ASCP preparation camp. In this camp, we will go through each topic on the ASCP lecture list. In today's video, we will be discussing manual and semi-automated testing in hematology. The field of clinical laboratory hematology has undergone significant development, transforming from just observing and describing blood components to a highly technical and automated science, including molecular examination. Despite this, some basic tests have remained largely unchanged. This chapter covers these basic tests and explores manual and semi-automated methods as alternatives to automation. Manual Cell Counts Manual cell counts are a method of manually counting white blood cell WBCs, platelet, and red blood cell RBCs counts in a laboratory setting. This method may be necessary when automated instruments are not available or cannot be used, such as in remote labs in developing countries, during a disaster situation, or when counts exceed the linearity of an instrument. The procedure uses a hemocytometer and manual dilutions made with calibrated pipettes and diluents. A hemocytometer is a tool used in manual cell counting. It is a chamber with two raised surfaces separated by an H-shaped moat. Each surface has a 3 by 3 mm square counting area with a grid of 9 1 by 1 mm squares. Each of the four corners of WBC squares is subdivided further into 16 squares, and the center square is subdivided into 25 smaller squares. Each of these smallest squares is 0.2 by 0.2 mm and there is a cover slip on top of the counting surfaces. The distance between the cover slip and counting surface is 0.1 mm giving a total volume of 0.9 mm cubic per grid on one side of the hemocytometer. The general formula for manual cell counts is as follows and can be used to calculate any type of cell count. White blood cell count. The WBCs or leukocyte count is the number of WBCs in 1 liter or 1 microliter of blood. Whole blood anticoagulated with ethylenediamine tetracyclic acid EDTA or blood from a skin puncture is diluted with 1% buffered ammonium oxalate or a weak acid solution 3% acetic acid or 1% hydrochloric acid. The diluting fluid lyses the non-nucleated red blood cells in the sample to prevent their interference with the count. The typical dilution of blood for the WBC count is 1 to 20. A hemocytometer is filled with the well-mixed dilution and placed under a microscope and the number of cells in the four large corner squares is counted. Procedure Prepare the hemocytometer and cover slip by cleaning them with alcohol and drying with a lint-free tissue. Then, place the cover slip on the hemocytometer. Make a 1 to 20 blood dilution by mixing 25 milliliters of blood with 475 milliliters of WBC diluting fluid in a test tube. Close the tube and shake it by inverting. Wait 10 minutes for red blood cells to lyse, resulting in a clear solution. The WBC count should be performed within 3 hours. Shake the solution again and pour it into a microhematocrit tube. Fill the hemocytometer by holding the microhematocrit tube at a 45 degree angle and touching the tip to the cover slip edge at the chamber floor. Allow the charged hemocytometer to sit in a moist chamber for 10 minutes to let the cells settle before counting. Place the hemocytometer on the microscope stage, keeping it in a horizontal position. Focus using the low power objective lens on the microscope by lowering the condenser. The cells should be evenly distributed in all squares. For a 1 to 20 dilution, count the cells in the four corner squares starting with the upper left hand square. Count cells that touch the top and left lines and ignore cells touching the bottom and right lines. The appearance of WBCs in the hemocytometer can be seen using the low power objective lens of the microscope. Perform the cell count again on the opposite side of the counting chamber. The deviation between the total cell count from each side should not exceed 10%. If the variation is greater, it may indicate an uneven distribution, and the procedure must be repeated. 
find the mean of the number of WBCs counted on both sides. Utilize this average to determine the WBC count using one of the provided equations. Sources of error and comments. Ensure proper cleaning of the hemocytometer and cover slip to avoid confusion caused by dust and fingerprints. Use a diluting fluid free of contaminants for accurate results. If the count is low, count a larger area for improved accuracy. Properly charge the chamber to ensure accurate cell distribution. Clean and recharge the chamber if it is overfilled or underfilled. Wait 10 minutes after filling the chamber to let cells settle before counting. Correct the WBC count of nucleated red blood cells NRBCs are present in the sample and counted as WBCs. If there are more than 5 NRBCs per 100 WBCs, use the formula. Uncorrected WBC count x 100 divided number of NRBCs per 100 WBCs plus 100. Evaluate the accuracy of the manual WBC count by comparing it to a WBC estimate on a right-stained peripheral blood film made from the same specimen. Platelet count. The platelet count measures the number of platelets present in 1 liter or 1 microliter of whole blood. Platelets can be challenging to count due to their tendency to stick to foreign objects and each other, as well as their small size and similarity to dirt or debris. To perform the platelet count, whole blood with EDTA as the anticoagulant is diluted 1 to 100 with 1% 1 ammonium oxalate to lyse non-nucleated red blood cells. The platelets are counted using a phase contrast microscope or a light microscope, with the reference method described by Brecker and Cronkite being the recommended method. The platelets are counted in the 25 small squares within the 1 mm square large center square of the hemocytometer. It is important to note that while a light microscope can be used, the visualization of platelets may be more difficult. Procedure To make a 1 to 100 dilution, add 20 milliliters of well-mixed blood to 1980 microliter of 1% 1 ammonium oxalate in a small test tube. Thoroughly mix the dilution and load it into the special flat-bottomed counting chamber for phase microscopy platelet counts. Allow the platelets to settle for 15 minutes by placing the charged hemocytometer in a moist chamber. Use a 40x objective lens to count the platelets. They appear round or oval and have a light purple sheen under phase contrast microscopy, which helps distinguish them from debris. Count the number of platelets in the 25 small squares in the center square of the grid, on each side of the hemocytometer and ensure the difference between the two totals is less than 10%. Calculate the platelet count using the relevant formula and verify its accuracy by performing a platelet estimate from the same specimen on a right-stained peripheral blood film. Sources of error and notes. Incorrect mixing and poor specimen collection can lead to platelet clumping on the hemocytometer. If the issue persists after redilution, a new sample is necessary. A skin puncture sample is not ideal because it may cause the platelets to aggregate. Dirt in the pipette, hemocytometer, or diluting solution can result in inaccurate counts. If less than 50 platelets are counted on each side, the procedure should be repeated with a 1 to 20 dilution. If over 500 platelets are counted on each side, a 1 to 200 dilution should be made and used in the results calculation. If the patient has a normal platelet count, the five small red blood cell squares may be counted, with an area of 0.2 mm square on each side. Using EDTA as an anticoagulant may result in platelet satellitosis, which is the adherence of platelets around neutrophils. Switching to sodium citrate anticoagulant should solve this issue, but keep in mind that the dilution in citrate evacuated tubes requires multiplying the obtained platelet count by 1.1 for accuracy. Red blood cell count. Manual RBC counts are rarely performed because of the inaccuracy of the count and questionable necessity. The use of other, more accurate manual RBC procedures, such as the microhematocrit and hemoglobin concentration, is desirable when automation is not available. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel, 
activate notifications to get our new videos, if you like our content please press the like button, and share the video with your friends. If you have any questions leave a comment below. Hemoglobin Determination The determination of hemoglobin is done to measure the amount of hemoglobin in the red blood cells, which carries oxygen to and carbon dioxide from the tissues. The reference method used is the cyanmethemoglobin, hemoglobin cyanide, method and it has been approved by the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute. Principle Involves diluting blood in an alkaline solution containing potassium ferrocyanide, potassium cyanide, sodium bicarbonate, and a surfactant. The potassium ferrocyanide oxidizes hemoglobin to methemoglobin, which is then converted to cyanmethemoglobin by potassium cyanide. The concentration of hemoglobin is directly proportional to the absorbance of cyanmethemoglobin at 540 nanometers. This method cannot measure sulfhemoglobin as it is not converted to cyanmethemoglobin, but sulfhemoglobin concentrations greater than 0.05 g per deciliter are rare in clinical practice. Procedure 1. A standard curve is created using a commercially available cyanmethemoglobin standard. A. Dilutions are made based on a standard containing 80 mg per deciliter of hemoglobin. B. The dilutions are transferred to cuvettes and the spectrophotometer is set to 540 nanometers and 100% transmittance with the help of the blank. C. A plot of percent transmittance against hemoglobin concentration is created on semi-logarithmic paper to read the hemoglobin concentration of the control and patient samples. D. The standard curve should be created with each new reagent lot and checked after any alterations made to the spectrophotometer. 2. A control sample should be run with each batch of samples. Commercial controls are available. 3. A 1 to 251 dilution of the patient's whole blood is made by adding 0.02 milliliters of blood to 5 milliliters of cyanmethemoglobin reagent. The pipette should be thoroughly rinsed to avoid any residue. The same procedure is followed for control samples. 4. The solutions are mixed well and allowed to stand for 10 minutes at room temperature for full conversion of hemoglobin to cyanmethemoglobin. 5. All the solutions are transferred to cuvettes and the spectrophotometer is set to 100% transmittance at 540 nanometers using the cyanmethemoglobin reagent as a blank. 6. The percent transmittance of the patient samples is read and recorded. 7. The hemoglobin concentration of the control and patient samples is determined from the standard curve. Sources of error and comments. Sensitivity to light is a source of error for the cyanmethemoglobin reagent. To avoid this, it should be stored in a brown bottle or a dark place. A high white blood cell count, or platelet count, can lead to a falsely high result due to turbidity. In such cases, the reagent sample solution can be centrifuged and the supernatant measured. Lipemia can also cause turbidity and a falsely high result. This can be corrected by adding 0.01 milliliters of the patient's plasma to 5 milliliters of cyanmethemoglobin reagent and using this mixture as the reagent blank. Hemoglobin S and hemoglobin C may lead to resistance to hemolysis, resulting in turbidity. This can be corrected by diluting the sample 1 to 2 with distilled water and multiplying the results from the standard curve by 2. Abnormal globulins such as those found in patients with plasma cell myeloma or Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia may cause precipitation in the reagent. To avoid this, add 0.1 grams of potassium carbonate to the cyanmethemoglobin reagent. Modern cyanmethemoglobin reagents contain potassium dihydrogen phosphate salt, making this issue unlikely to occur. Carboxyhemoglobin can theoretically cause erroneous results if the sample is from a heavy smoker, as it takes one hour to convert to cyanmethemoglobin. However, the degree of error is likely not significant. Cyanmethemoglobin reagent is highly toxic due to the presence of cyanide, and caution must be exercised when using it.
consult the manufacturer's safety data sheet and use a licensed waste disposal service to dispose of the reagent. Acidification of cyanide in the reagent releases toxic hydrogen cyanide gas. Commercial absorbent standards kits are available for calibrating spectrophotometers. Microhematocrit. Hematocrit is a measurement of the volume of packed red blood cells relative to the volume of whole blood. This volume is represented either as a percentage or in liters per liter and is referred to as packed cell volume PCV. The procedure for determining hematocrit involves the following steps. Fill two plain capillary tubes, approximately three quarters full, with blood that has been anticoagulated with EDTA or heparin. Mylar wrapped tubes, as recommended by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, are used to reduce the risk of capillary tube injuries. Blood can also be collected into heparinized capillary tubes through skin puncture. Wipe any excess blood from the outside of the tube. Seal the end of the tube using non-absorbent clay and the colored ring. Hold the filled tube horizontally, insert the dry end into a tray with sealing compound at a 90-degree angle, and rotate the tube slightly before removing it. The plug should be at least 4 mm long. Balance the tubes in a microhematocrit centrifuge with the clay ends facing outside away from the center and touching the rubber gasket. Secure the head cover on the centrifuge and close the top. Centrifuge the tubes at 10,000 to 15,000 for the determined amount of time to achieve maximum packing of red blood cells. Do not use the brake to stop the centrifuge. Use a microhematocrit reading device to determine the hematocrit by reading the level of red blood cell packing and excluding the buffy coat. The values of the duplicate hematocrits should be within 1% of each other. Sources of error and comments. Decreased hematocrit readings may occur due to improper sealing of the capillary tube causing blood leakage during centrifugation. The red blood cells are packed in the lower part of the tube, causing a higher loss compared to plasma. Red blood cell shrinkage may result in decreased hematocrit readings due to increased concentration of anticoagulant, short draw in an evacuated tube. Improper mixing of the specimen can result in decreased or increased hematocrit readings. Proper centrifugation time and speed, and prompt reading of results, are important for accurate hematocrit readings. Insufficient centrifugation or delayed readings will result in increased hematocrit readings. The time for complete packing should be determined for each centrifuge and regularly checked. When calibrating the microhematocrit centrifuge, one of the samples must have a hematocrit of 50% or higher. The hematocrit reading should not include the buffy coat, which falsely elevates the result. Incorrect use of the microhematocrit reader may result in decreased or increased readings. Disorders like sickle cell anemia, macrocytic anemias, hypochromic anemias, spherocytosis, and thalassemia may cause trapped plasma in the red blood cell layer leading to higher microhematocrit readings compared to automated instruments that calculate or directly measure the hematocrit. A temporarily low hematocrit reading may occur after blood loss because plasma is replaced faster than red blood cells. Dehydration causes fluid loss and falsely increases the hematocrit reading. Proper specimen collection is crucial, and interstitial fluid from a skin puncture or improper flushing of an intravenous catheter may result in decreased hematocrit readings. Reticulocytes count. The reticulocytes count is a measure of the bone marrow's erythropoietic activity, and it is obtained by counting the number of reticulocytes in the blood. Reticulocytes are immature red blood cells in their final stage of development, and they spend two days in the bone marrow and one day in the peripheral blood before maturing into red blood cells. They are characterized by the presence of cytoplasmic ribonucleic acid RNA remnants, mitochondria, and ribosomes. Principle. The reticulocytes count is determined by staining anticoagulated EDTA blood with a supravital stain like new methylene blue. 
A red blood cell that has two or more particles of blue stained granulofilamentous material after the staining process is considered reticulocytes. Procedure Combine blood and new methylene blue stain in equal portions, using 2 to 3 drops or around 50 milliliters of each. Let it sit at room temperature for 3 to 10 minutes. Stir the mixture. Make two thin blood smears. Observe a densely packed area of cells under the high-power microscope lens and count 1,000 red blood cells. Reticulocytes should be included in the RBC count. To enhance accuracy, have another lab technician count the second smear and ensure the counts are within 20% agreement. Sources of error and notes. If the patient's blood cell count is either severely low or high, the proportion of stain to blood must be adjusted accordingly. Incorrect mixing of the blood and stain before creating the slides may result in an error, as the reticulocytes have a lower specific gravity and tend to settle on top during incubation. Refractal areas on the slide, which can be caused by moisture in the air or poor drying, can be mistaken for reticulocytes, but the RNA remnants in reticulocytes are not refractal. Supervitally stained red blood cells inclusions, such as Heinz bodies, Howell Jolly bodies, and Pappenheimer bodies can also be present. Heinz bodies are round or oval precipitated hemoglobin that tends to adhere to the cell membrane, while Howell Jolly bodies are round nuclear fragments and usually singular. The presence of iron in the mitochondria, which can be confirmed with an iron stain like Prussian blue, can also cause Pappenheimer bodies. Erythrocyte sedimentation rate. ESR is a test used to detect and track the progression of inflammatory conditions, such as rheumatoid arthritis, infections, and certain cancers. It is also helpful in diagnosing temporal arteritis and polymyalgia rheumatica. However, the ESR is not a specific indicator of inflammation can be elevated for other reasons, including pregnancy, anemia, plasma cell myeloma, and aging. Additionally, technical errors can alter the results. Because of its low specificity and sensitivity, the ESR is not recommended as a screening test for detecting inflammation in people without symptoms. Other tests for measuring inflammation, such as the C-reactive protein level, may be a more reliable and effective alternative. The principle of ESR is determined by measuring the distance in millimeters that red blood cells fall in an anticoagulated blood sample after being left at room temperature for an hour. Factors such as red blood cell count, plasma proteins, and mechanical and technical variables affect the rate of red blood cell sedimentation. Diseases that cause alterations in plasma fibrinogen and globulins can result in red blood cell stacking, rouleau's formation, increasing their mass and leading to a faster ESR. The ESR is directly proportional to red blood cell mass and inversely proportional to plasma viscosity. There are various manual and automated methods for measuring ESR, but only the most commonly used ones are discussed. Widely used method for measuring ESR is the modified Westergren method. The benefit of this method is that it can detect high ESR levels, and it is the recommended method by the International Council for Standardization in Hematology and the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute. Procedure Mix the blood collected in EDTA and dilute it by adding 4 parts of blood to 1 part of 3.8% sodium citrate or 0.85% sodium chloride, 2 ml blood and 0.5 ml diluent. You can also collect the blood directly into special sedimentation test tubes that contain sodium citrate. Note that standard coagulation test tubes are not suitable as the dilution is 9 parts blood to 1 part sodium citrate. Put the diluted sample into a 200 mm column with an internal diameter of at least 2.55 mm. Put the column into the rack and leave it undisturbed at room temperature. 18 to 25 degrees Celsius, for 60 minutes. Ensure the rack is level. Record the distance in millimeters that the red blood cells have fallen in one hour. Do not include the Buffy code in the reading. 
Read the tube from the bottom of the plasma layer to the top of the sedimented red blood cells, and report the result as the ESR, 1 hour equals X millimeter. Thank you for completing the video, remember to ask for ASCP short notes, and don't forget to subscribe, bye.